Diabetes Connections is brought to you by One Touch. Every touch is a step forward. By Dexcom, take control of your diabetes and live life to the fullest by Dexcom. By Tandem Diabetes Care, makers of the T-Slim X2 insulin pump. And by Real Good Foods, real food you feel good about eating. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, Ask the D-Moms. Maura McCarthy and I answer your questions about picky eaters, fear of shots, and a lot of questions about summer. We'll help you prepare for the pool or the beach and hopefully help you relax and enjoy. I know I have said this to you before, my friend Stacy, but there should be a lab that checks for happiness results too. And that is just as important as any blood sugar average or time and range or anything. Some helpful information to get our happiness labs up. I love that. In our community connection this week, some pushback from the DIY community as the FDA targets an off-label use issue. But isn't all type 1 diabetes kind of do-it-yourself anyway? We'll talk about it. And tell me something good, sports and type 1 diabetes, some big wins to share. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your health care provider. Welcome to another week of Diabetes Connections. I'm your host, Stacey Sims. So glad to have you along. As this episode is airing the second week of June, Benny is at diabetes camp. Yeah, my son is 14 now. He was diagnosed right before he turned two. And this is his eighth summer. We were counting. It's his eighth summer away at this week-long diabetes sleepaway camp in our area. I'm a big fan of camp, as you know. So it'll be interesting to report back. He's moved up a unit, as they do as they get older. It's every two or three years. So new stuff for <clears throat> the rising freshman. Oh, my God. We'll talk more about camp and how it went. And maybe he'll talk to me again, as we've done in some of the summers past. And this time of year also means that the big summer conference have kicked off. This past weekend was the American Diabetes Association uh, Scientific Sessions. There is usually a lot of news that comes out of these conferences, starting with this one. So we will try to keep up with that, but I can't pretend here on a weekly podcast that will get you everything that you want to know. So I'll be posting a lot as things come through in the Diabetes Connections Facebook group. So please sign up for that. It's very easy to find. It's obviously on Facebook. It's called Diabetes Connections, the group. And there will be, you know, new studies, research, announcements, usually at least one of the Pump or CGM companies has something that they're waiting and holding on to. So uh, as that comes out, it may have already come out over the weekend. As I said, we will be posting it in the group. And the other thing I want to tell you is that we have a big announcement coming later this month. It might be very soon, definitely by June 15th, and you will want to make sure you are signed up for the newsletter. I can't tell you all about it yet, but it is what many of you have been asking me for, and it rhymes with scramscriptions. It will only be available (laughs) via the newsletter. I didn't give it away, did I? Uh, But this really will just be the newsletter. No social media on this one. It'll come through email, and we will be announcing it over social media and in the show when it's ready. But uh, please sign up by the 15th if you haven't already for the newsletter so you do not miss out on this. All right, my segment with Maura McCarthy coming up in just a minute. And I need to tell you, we did tape that almost two weeks ago now. And I say that only because we start out talking about the weather. And I almost can guarantee the weather has gotten better and hotter where Mora is. It's definitely gotten hotter here. And she'll talk about that coming up. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom. Do you know about Dexcom Clarity? This is their diabetes management software. And for a long time, I thought it was something our endo used. But you can use it on both the desktop or as an app on your phone. It's an easy way to keep track of the big picture. I check it about once a week. It really helps me and Benny 
dial back and see longer term trends and helps us not to overreact to what happened for just one day or even one hour. I've been known to do that. The overlay reports help context to Betty's glucose levels and patterns. If you heard our episode on CGM, you heard Gary Shiner, uh, CDE, talking about those spaghetti reports and things. And that's what he's talking about. You can even share the reports with your care team, which makes appointments a lot more productive. Managing diabetes is not easy, but I feel like we have one of the best CGM systems working for us. Find out more at diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. Hey, Maura, how are you? Love talking to you. It's great to check in. What's going on? Oh, I am sitting in cold and damp northeastern United States just waiting for summer to come. I know it's going to come. I know it is. How can it still be damp and cold up there? Where? How far north do you live? <laughs> uh, welcome to New England Springs. Every year people are like, it's going to be nice in May. And I'm like, yeah, no, it's not going to be nice till the middle of June. But that's okay. When it comes, it's perfect. We love I our summers. I know, I know. We have about one week or two of spring and severe allergies here in the Charlotte area. And then it's summer. So it's in, you know, it's in the 90s. And I tape the podcast in like a little attic room. And I just turned the fans off. And so <laughs> this will never be a video show, especially in the summer, because it's like, uh, I'm just sweating. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I actually moved out of my office. And I'm sitting in a really cute new green leather reclining chair I bought. I'm quite comfortable. Oh, so our little off. chat today is going to be comfortable. Oh, well, for one of us. Okay, let's get started. We got some great questions about summer. But before we get to some seasonal stuff, we got a couple of questions really on, on the same line here about trying to get especially little ones. Uh, this is about a four-year-old and a six-year-old to try different foods. Keisha says, my four-year-old type one, very picky, will not try different foods. And Lisa writes in that her six-year-old, it seems like he's afraid of food, kind of afraid knowing that he is going to get a shot. So, wow. yeah, it's kind of difficult. And I'd love to hear your take, and then I'll, I'll give mine, too. So, you know, when Lauren was little, it was the era of NPH and regular when, and it was also pre-carb counting. We did meal plans, and uh, you had to eat a certain amount of fruit, a certain amount of protein, a certain amount of starch, etc. with each meal. So you would prepare this perfect meal, and you would give her the shot, and then you had to wait at least a half an hour and then eat. And it was just like, oh, my goodness, you know, with a little kid. So when the rapid acting insulins that we have now came out, uh, it was quite exciting for us to be able to realize that while you want to try to teach your child to eat well, that sometimes with a small child, it's just impossible. And if you can have an insulin that allows you sort of a little bit of freedom from that, you can ease into it. Does that make sense to you? It really does. And we were fortunate to have started on the faster acting insulin. So Benny started out with carb counting and never started out with the exchange program, which I just think sounds so difficult. And as you said, you know, everybody with diabetes was having the snack at the same time. Kind of Literally. <laughs> but to those moms, I would say, I'm guessing that this may have been a little bit of an issue before their children were diagnosed, but they didn't notice it as much because you weren't as hyper focused on food as you become once type one diabetes comes into your life. And I would suggest that while they want to listen to their nutritionists and they want to guide their children to eat well, that if they were okay before, just kind of go back to how you were. Now, there's insulin involved, so you can't quite go back to where you were. My friend Claire, whose daughter is now an adult, had this great story. She was diagnosed when she was two, like Benny, and she would do exactly what I described to you. And then she would sit Claire down in her little high chair, and Claire would go, me no hungry. And now the regular insulin is in you, <laughs> and your MPH is peaking, oh and there's no way you cannot eat. And so she's got a toddler, so she would just whip open the fridge and freezer and say, anything, pick anything you want to get it into your body. You don't have to do that yeah, anymore. Yeah. Oh. And some of the things that you can talk to your endocrinologist about are bolusing after they eat. I mean, it's not ideal. And if they eat, you will get a little spike, but it's better than giving them the insulin and having them not eat what you want them to eat or eat at all. 
a pre-bolus of a tiny amount of insulin just to get things going, and then the rest on the other side once you know that they eat. There's all kinds of things that you can talk to your endocrinology team about doing. My feeling is we want to raise healthy kids, and we have the kind of insulin now where we can kind of do it the same way we did it before. What I would also recommend is to talk to your endo, talk to your nutritionist, and kind of we we worry so much at every stage kind of thinking, this is it, right? My four-year-old is only eating four foods, and it's always going to be like that. And in, in very rare cases, it is, but there's usually something else going on with that person. Usually, if you keep introducing foods, which is very frustrating, I know, eventually they will try it. I had no problem with Benny because he would eat pretty much whatever. My older child, who doesn't have type 1, she was a very good eater until she was about 5. And then she decided on about 5 foods, and she stuck with that until she was about 12. And now she's a lot better. Yeah. And so I think we worry so much that, well, they're such a picky eater. You know, again, you got to talk to your doctor, but they're going to be okay. And it's okay to just, you know, feed them that amount of food. A lot of endos will also tell you, maybe set a timer. You know, if your child eats within 20 minutes, great. If the timer goes off, that meal is over, you know, go and move along. And we bolused after until age seven, approximately. And, you know, Benny, our routine is to do a lot of pre-bolusing. But of course, he'll forget or things happen. And as you mentioned, you'll get that spike. You see it on the CGM and it's so frightening to see that spike, you know, because you look online and people say, oh, no, no, you you have to pre-bolus. You have to get that straight line. Well, you know, you also want to raise a child that has good eating habits. And we all have so many crazy food issues with it, with or without diabetes that I, I don't think it's worth the stress. Right. As, as you said, a bolusing ahead of time with a little kid because they learn they know that they're going to get anything in the fridge as your right. poor friend. Those said. were the days. Hey, my friend Maureen, oh. who's my age, who doesn't have diabetes, I swear to God, she's only eaten hamburgers her entire life and she's perfectly healthy. Yeah. So whatever. Now, as for the little boy who is afraid of the shots or doesn't want to eat because of the shots, that's kind of a whole other issue. And that mom is going to have to work a little on acceptance and finding different ways to make the shot less stressful for the child. And I know it sounds really mean, but the particularly the rapid acting insulin shots, they don't really hurt. It's more the anticipation of them. So if they can figure out something like sing a, you sing a funny song while you do it, or I don't know, whatever works for that child, that might help. And so maybe they'll be able to move away from, I don't want to eat because then I have to get a shot. Another thing that I think is super cool, although who in this world has time to do it, is taking your child and having them pick out a recipe and then bringing them to the store. It's a great educational experience. It has math. It has science. It has chemistry. And then preparing the meal together because kids usually will try something new if they've prepared it. And like I said, if you're a working parent, that, that might be difficult, but you could do it on a Saturday or Sunday, maybe, and just try to get some new foods in that way. Yeah, that's a great idea. My husband, who owned a restaurant for many years, tried to cook a lot with the kids when he was home. And I think that was a big influence in turning Leah around and helping her try a lot of new foods. And I would also add, and it's Lisa who has the child who's afraid of the shots, and she doesn't say here if they're newly diagnosed or how long they've been in it. I would say if your child is newer diagnosed, like let's say within two weeks or a month, then just keep going ahead with the shots, right? We're just going to do this. It's a routine. It's it's terrible. You know, the child is reacting poorly, but hey, we're here. And then you can go in the shower and cry later. But, you know, you've got to kind of keep it routine. But if this is someone who is more than that, maybe let's say, you know, three months, six months, a year in, and they're still struggling, you've got to talk to your endo about this. There are some things that you can do. I know people feel differently about this. We never tried these things, but there is things like the buzzy, which is kind of a, you know, a distracting, I I don't know exactly what you call it. I wouldn't call it pain relief, but it kind of distracts the body. There are pressure methods you can use to do the same thing, distract the body. If your child's really worried about that, I know a few friends who've had success with a device called the iPort. And this is something that Medtronic makes. I think they're the only ones. There might be another maker out there, but it goes on the body like a pump inset. The needle goes in, the needle comes out, leaves a small cannula behind. You change that every three days, but you can give all the shots through it and then you don't feel anything. But I think, as you said earlier, Maura, this is about anticipation. 
it doesn't really hurt. And the kids get over it very, very quickly. But if your child isn't over it and that anticipation has built up, and this is good if your kid's on a pump too, sometimes that fear just builds up and builds on itself. These distraction methods can really help. So I definitely talk to your endo because you don't want to have that, that fear of food, you know, is so difficult for the whole household. I mean, everything can come to a stop. Right back to my conversation with Maura in just a moment. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by One Touch. Have you ever tested your blood sugar with a meter and were unsure about the meaning of your result? Take the guesswork out of your numbers with the One Touch Vario Flex Meter. It uses color short technology to instantly show you when your or your loved one's blood sugar numbers are low, indicated by blue, in range, green or high, red, so you can quickly get on with your life. You can also use the meter's built-in Bluetooth smart technology to seamlessly sync with the OneTouch Reveal mobile app, available now as a free download for Android devices on Google Play and Apple devices on the App Store. OneTouch, because taking a step forward starts with seeing where you are. Now back to my conversation with Maura McCarthy as we're trying to get some advice for the kids who are reluctant to take shots. Sure. And so that's why what, what you just talked about is why I always try to stop parents from using a numbing cream, because in my unprofessional opinion, all a numbing cream does is add on to the time of anticipation. And then the other thing I would say it sounds like to me is get Slade to come to your house and cook meals. <laughs> all set. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh. It's so fun. You know, we really, we're really fortunate that way. And Leah even put it, she talked about it in her senior speech, her school, like every senior gets to give a little speech. And she talked about cooking with her dad. Aww. So that was really cool. I know. So Sunrise. Nice. Okay. Sunset. Oh, gee, don't, I'm going to start crying. We're still doing all the graduation stuff over here. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Okay, so hey, it is that time of year. How's that for a segue? Get away from my emotions there. Yeah, quick. <laughs> Let's talk summer. Woo! Let's talk summer schedules uh, or the lack of, of schedules. We had always found that this time of year, um, frankly, we saw higher numbers. We saw, you know, more difficult day to day routines because there, there is no routine in my house in the summertime a lot of the time. And we were talking about this in my local Facebook group. There weren't that many solutions, but there were a lot of questions about it. Uh, what did you guys do in the summer? Oh my gosh. I love summer. And believe it or not, I loved summer for diabetes. Like we were the opposite of you. It isn't that we were, well, maybe she was kind of more scheduled when I think about it. I'll explain. But in the summer, it took a year or two to figure it all out. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But in the summer, Lauren needed 40 to 50% less insulin the whole summer than she needed any other season. She could eat like s'mores and not bolus for them and still be in the 80s and 90s. <laughs> it's just there's something about heat and summer in her. Also, we live in a beach town. I mean, we're members of a beach club. She was always either in the pool or in the ocean or running up and down the beach or in tennis lessons, like all day long every day, because that's our lifestyle here. And it was fantastic. And I always say to parents who are afraid of the lows or the spikes or anything, just see it through. Like don't the first few days, even the first couple of weeks, they go out with your endocrinologist overseeing, of course, just kind of let things happen so you can see how they play out. Like some kids might spike from excitement if they go to a pool or the beach and then they might come down naturally because it was an adrenaline spike. And you're never going to know that if you see the spike on your CGM and you automatically react to it. So kind of chill out into it and see what happens. And then eventually you'll pretty much know what they're going to need in the summertime. I, seriously, summer was so good for us in diabetes, just so good. Yeah, and it's funny to think about it because when Benny's at camp, when he did day camps or he does sleepaway camps, uh, the, we have to cut back on the insulin. There's no doubt the the heat, the activity is definitely great. You know, exercise is always good. But it was especially as the teenage and more independent years have kicked in, it's the sleeping really late, grazing for meals all day, going to bed after me, you know, so he's eating later at night. And that's the kind of thing that we found kind of difficult. And what our solution was, was to, and, and we are a little bit more laid back, I understand that, was to just say, hey, check at these intervals, make sure you're dosing, 
and it, it'll all come together. And I tried to keep, you know, not a lot of junk in the house. And certainly, you know, I don't know if you remember those. Well, I'm sure you do remember. We just talked about it. The days of those free snacks, you know, but you try to keep veggies and low carb fruits or whatever for those times when he's just going to be eating all day long. But at the same time, I also have ice cream in my house, you know, and I have bananas and I have stuff that people want to eat. So it, it was just a balance for us of at least put the insulin in your body if you're going to be eating all day long, the CGM makes it a little bit easier to graze, certainly. But my advice for people without one is, look, just check at regular intervals. And correct. And don't worry about what's happened if it's, you know, three hours between times that you check. And I'm going to go on from that and say, someone recently on one of our pages uh, that you or I are on asked, how am I going to have my kids CGM working if they're jumping in and out of the water. And I was like, well, why don't you just not have it work? It's only for a few hours. And like you just said, summer is about freedom and life is about balance. And a few hours of happiness on the beach is only going to make your child healthy in so many ways. I know that's an unpopular thing to say right now, but it's going to be okay if you don't see their blood sugars for a few hours here and there. You just check with a meter, and then if they were high, you correct it. And if they're low, they say, I feel low, and they eat something, right? You know, it's funny. When we did not have a CGM, Benny was ages two to nine. And I would say we probably checked six to eight times a day. You know, we had regular intervals. We were very careful. He was supervised. And then when we got the CGM, even when you were calibrating and doing everything you're supposed to do, just that natural age of 11, 12, 13, 14, you check less. You know, if you've been doing this as long as we have, you, uh, I don't want to say you worry less, but it's just not as, uh, you understand it, it's not. Right, I think you do worry less. So checking every three hours at home seems very reasonable to me if all he's doing is loafing around, (laughs) you know, and it's not forever. It's not the whole summer. It's not their whole life. So to me, that works. But let's talk about the beach, because what a great segue. We had a question from Jennifer, who said, I am going to the beach for the first time. What should I bring? What do I do? How do I manage? Now, this is really open-ended. But what I'd like to talk about is schlepping the supplies. And Maura, you're at a beach club all, all the, the time. time. So I'm, I'm guessing you have this down. And it's a little different if you go every day, as opposed to somebody like me, who goes maybe once or twice a summer to the beach. So let's start with you. How did you guys handle So first that? of all, you have to think about what do you actually need? Because you don't necessarily need every single thing in your diabetes inventory when you go to the beach. You need a meter, even if you're on a CGM, because, you know, you might have to do a backup check. You definitely need either your pump or your needles and insulin. You definitely need a low glucose treatment, whether it's glucose tabs or juice or whatever you put in your cooler. And you got to bring your glucagon with you. And other than that, you don't really need a lot. One of the things that I would say is um, if you're on a pump with tubing, and I'm going to say this loud and clear, you can absolutely swim all day long, every single day, on and off, in and out of the water with a pump of tubing. It's super easy. It's not complicated, despite what you may hear other people say. So if you have a pump of tubing, a really important thing to bring is something to put that pump in when the child is not wearing it. It's not enough to just wrap it in a towel because then someone's going to grab the towel to dry themselves off and the pump's going to go flying in the sand and you're never going to find it. So just some kind of (laughs) guy used to use those little pouches like soft glasses, eyeglass cases. You know what I mean? The ones that are like wipes too. uh And I could just put it in that and then I would put it in the bottom of a bag that I had under my chair so that it wasn't directly in the sun. So I'd say that's an important thing too. But the most important thing is something to treat a low blood sugar. Definitely. And I'll back you up for sure on the tubed pump, because that's all we've ever had. And we have been in and out of water all summer long, taking it on and off, even when we used the Animus Ping, which was waterproof, even especially in the ocean. I don't think it was ocean proof. I don't think any device is, does really well in salt water like that. Um, so we always took it off. And you have to talk to your endo because, again, everybody's different. But taking it on and off was fine. And they'll tell you, you know, what what the limit is. I think a lot of this depends on age and experience and weight and different things. But, you know, we could leave Betty's pump off, especially when he was little, for two hours because he was so Mm -hmm. active. And then put it back in, check blood sugar. Now he's actually less active 
you know, you think about how a four-year-old plays in the water and how a 14-year-old plays in the water. It's, you know, four-year-old uses their whole body. That's right. <laughs> for, for every second. It's true. Yeah. Whereas a 14-year-old, he's playing ball or maybe he's skimming a little, you know, he's doing like some surfing kind of. So he could go a little bit less time. But, you know, we also brought everything you mentioned and the way I like to do it. And again, we go to the beach probably less than, than you do. It's more of a beach trip. So I always take, and I did this at the pool when Benny was younger too, a hard-sided small yes. cooler. And that was great because I could throw everything that you mentioned in there, including some drinks for me, with an ice pack. And I put the diabetes supplies in plastic bags so that they wouldn't be directly against yes. the ice. Although it was probably never a problem, but I was just paranoid about that. And then you have a place to put your pump, you have a place to put your meter, your cell phone, because if those things get too hot, they just don't work. But what's what's funny, and I, I want to make sure to remember to mention when you use a tubed pump, and your experience will vary here, a lot of them, well, all of them, when you use a tubed pump, they come with, the, the insets come with these little pitchfork looking things. They clip into the inset, and most of us look at them and say, what the heck is that? We yeah, never we never used, used it. But, <laughs> right. But then... The one day you get sand in the inset and you can't clip the tubing back in, you say, oh, my gosh, that's what that's for. And that happened to us when Benny was about six years old. And we realized, duh, that's what those little there's got to be a real name for them. But I call them the pitchfork things. That's what they're there for. I would add to that anyone with a child on a pump bring two extra sites with you on any beach trip, just in case. You're not going to need them, but just in case, you never know. And bring your long-acting pen and bring your short-acting pen that your endo gave you because you should have a prescription for those in case something happens with the pump. It's when you're away at the beach or things go crazy that you need those. But you, you always should have the backup. But it just seems like when we're away that it, you, know, you need it more. Um, the other thing about the thingamabobs or whatever you called it, the pitchfork thingy, is um, if you don't have one with you and you find yourself in a jam, this is exactly what happened to us the first time it happened. We were we went to the beach, then we went to a restaurant, and at the, it was right from the beach. You know, it's one of those you can pull up in a bathing suit. And when we went to reconnect the pump to Bolus Benny, we couldn't get the pump back in because it, the inset was full of sand. And we were dumping water bottles on him. I mean, we looked like <laughs> crazy people. Finally, we just did an inset change right at the restaurant, but we didn't have the thingies to plug in. So Slade, um, he just said, well, look, we have extra tubing. We have all these extra insets that we brought. So he cut the end off uh, the, the old tubing, you know, and tied it in a knot. And then the inset connector, you know, the end of the tubing has that pitchforky thing on it that you have to connect anyway. That's what we used for the rest oh. of the location. Yeah, so it was manageable. And I've actually given that advice to a couple of people online who are, I'm stuck somewhere. I don't have, you know, any of the pitchforky things, but I have the, I know someone is listening and we're driving them crazy by calling it the wrong thing. Um, but, you know, they have the extra insets and extra tubing. So it works out and it really worked well for us. Yeah, he can MacGyver pretty much anything. We're pretty So also advice is bring Slade to the beach. <laughs> Another thing about the beach is, and I know it sounds like I say this all the time, but just have fun. Set the first time aside to kind of work it all out and see what you need and what you didn't need and figure it out. And then just bring what you need and just enjoy yourself. Don't worry a lot about the diabetes all day. Soak in the sun, listen to the water. It's such a, the beach is such a great place to just feel good and be happy. So don't lose sight of the reason that you're going there. That's a great point because it we can work ourselves up into this. Not only do I have to keep an eye on all of this technology, but I have to make sure that everything is perfect. I get very wrapped up in that. You know, I, I want to have a good time. I want to enjoy my friends and family, but I want his blood sugars to be perfect. And it may sound silly after all this time to admit that, but it's true. And I have to constantly remind myself, He's fine. It's okay. And here's something even more embarrassing. About two years ago, I was so worried about the Dexcom. He was in and out of the water, and I kept thinking, it's going to come off. It's going to come off. You know, oh my gosh, I just, oh. And of course, it came off. You worried it off. Right. I worried it <laughs> off. And Benny said, you know what? Let's just leave it off for a couple of days because I'm going to go swimming tomorrow. I'm going to go swimming the next day. And it was not ideal because I will admit, I like having the CGM. But I found myself, when that worry was lifted, I was enjoying being in the beach more. I was able to jump at the waves. I was able to watch him, you know, play with friends. I, was, I wasn't thinking, is it going to come off? It was just this little, well, it wasn't little. It was, a, it was a pain. It was a worry in my head. And once it came off, it was 
one less thing to worry about. Oh, and you're not talking about all the time. You're talking about a little beach trip. And I will remind you, I know I have said this to you before, my friend Stacy, but there should be a lab that checks for happiness results, too. <laughs> and that is just as important as any blood sugar average or time and range or anything. So I bet that that day after that fell out, his happiness labs were extremely good. Yeah. And that's another thing to keep in mind. I thought you were going to say my happiness labs, you know, well, yours not, too. No, but yours yeah, are but important. Well, mine yeah. are important and mine went up, but you know what, when we worry and we hover and we do these things, it affects their happiness level. And we've got to be careful about that because, you know, he just wants to go have fun at the beach. <laughs> yeah, it's super hard to not worry, but practice makes perfect. And not worrying does not mean you don't care. It doesn't. It isn't that you're ignoring it all. You have prepared for the day and you're having fun and you're just not going to worry about it and you have a plan and it's all going to be great. Oh, we are going to the beach this year, but this is crazy. I am taking Benny and a friend of his while Slade and my daughter do something else, because honestly, Slade and my daughter are not crazy about the beach. So we are kind of splitting up for this little, this is a short trip, but I keep thinking, why am I taking two 14-year-old boys? What is wrong with me? I mean, forget the diabetes. I don't want to know what they're eating. They have their own little room. It's going to smell so bad. I was just going to say smell. <laughs> Definitely smell. <laughs> That's really funny. One thing we should bring up too, and I don't think we have the real answers to this because it is so individualized, is getting the gear to stick in the first place. Uh, yeah. Oh, and I, I will uh, link up some resources. We did a show, gosh, it's already two years ago, where I asked listeners for their best tips. And maybe I'll redo that this summer because we got some great advice, but there's new products out there. But everybody's skin is so different that what works for me may not work for you. But I would suggest that you tool around as you listen online. And, you know, if you wear gear on your arm, there's a way to cover it. If you wear gear on your stomach, there are different ways to cover it. But there are patches and tapes and, you know, it stinks that you have to do all of this. But, you know, the other thing I recommend, and we've done this in my local group, if you have a group of uh, diabetes families, if you can get together and everybody kind of brings what they have. Because like, oh, if, yeah. Yeah, if you're using like stay put and they've sent you two dozen patches and you're using Griff Grips and you're using whatever Dexcom sent to you and you've just got Tegaderm or Opsite Flexifix. I mean, I can, obviously we've tried a lot of different products. Then you can kind of get together and it's like a deck of cards. Who wants this? Right. And you can kind of pass them around and try different things. And that really helps because we have found and I'll just use Benny as an example. The best thing for him is just using skin tack liquid underneath. Many of the tapes actually pull his sights off sooner than they should come off. And the only thing that works reliably, he has used Stay Put, which is a brand, um, and they're online. And he has also, we have found that a large waterproof Band-Aid, of all things, when we are really in a situation, like we were, we're so fortunate, we went to Israel this past year and swam in the Dead Sea. And I was less concerned about the Dexcom coming off and losing the readings than I was about damaging the Dexcom because of all the salt or losing it in the Dead Sea. So we just covered the whole thing with a clear plastic Band-Aid and it worked beautifully and he was able to peel it off carefully. And, you know, we didn't cut a hole out or anything for the, the sensor and the transmitter. He was able to just pull it off gently afterward. Um, and that really worked well. That's so simple. Oh, and you don't have to go through a provider to get it. You just go to the CVS or wherever and buy it. I like that. Yeah, that's a really simple way to do it. And if, you know, if your kid is up for it, you know, it may last a week. We've never tried it, but it may last the life of the Dexcom. And we had no problems getting readings through it either. We did not cut a hole in it. So, hey, there's, you know, there's your tip. That's a good tip. <laughs> good one. I think that's it. I mean, we had some great questions this week. We would love to hear from you. You can um, just chime in at the Facebook group, which is Diabetes Connections, the group. I do post in, you know, we're in so many Facebook groups. I, I do post in one different group every month just to kind of pass it around. But I think the home base of the Diabetes Connections podcast group is the, the best way to weigh in. Or you can always email me, Stacy at diabetes-connections.com or, you know, contact me or Mora on social media and get your questions in because we do have a lot of summer left and we've got a lot of mom issues that we can cover any time of the year. Definitely. Maybe we, the next one, you and I should be at a beach talking to each other from the beach. 
Oh my gosh, I am That would there. be a sound challenge though. We can imagine I mean, we're at the beach. Maybe we, we'll get a sound engineer intern from one of the Do you have any colleges that are right on the beach? We've got Wilmington here. Let's see what else we could scare up. I love that idea. <laughs> All right. Well, I will talk to you very soon. In fact, I'm going to see you pretty soon. Wait a minute. We're going to see each other next month. That's right. Yay. Oh, so Maura and I are, are doing a couple of sessions at Friends for Life, which is the, I believe it's the largest family convention for people with type 1 diabetes. Every year in July, I've talked about it quite a bit on the show here, but we're doing some sessions. We're doing the closing keynote together. I'm so excited for that. And uh, if you're going to be there, definitely let us know. Come say hi. Yeah, find us and definitely come to the closing keynote. It's going to be like this, only we're all hanging out together. It's going to be and fun. There might be some prizes in there. I was too. just going to say, we have prizes. I'm stocking up the prize closet. I feel like I'm at my old radio station. <laughs> right. Win a date with Brad. <laughs> <laughs> at my radio station, it was more like win a baseball hat. <laughs> yeah. I remember when I was a kid, I won a six pack of RC Cola on the radio. Oh. and It was like the best thing that ever happened in my life. Oh, my God, I love it. People will just have to see what you're going to win. Oh, my God. Quick side note. We did this game show at my last radio station, and it was called The Brain Game. It was like a reverse trivia contest, and we did it at 5.50 a.m. We did it before the 6 o'clock news, so it was a very dedicated audience. Yeah. And I still have T-shirts. I should see if I have any extras. It was really funny. Stump Stacy on The Brain Game. Collector's item. I don't know about that. All right. Oh, I friend. hope people but, find us at Friends for Life. Find us, say hi. We want to meet you and we want to hang out with you. Definitely come see us. It's in July. We'll have more information. I'll be talking about it on the podcast throughout the month of June. Maura, I'll see you then. Awesome. And Stacy, share with the people some of those photos from past Friends for Life of us on your oh. Diabetes <laughs> Connection page. That will either make them want to meet us or run in the other direction. <laughs> will do. Okay. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. And we're just over a month away from that Friends for Life conference where Maura and I are going to be doing some joint sessions and we're doing the closing keynote together. So if you're going to be there, I really hope you put in your planner. They've got an app and you can figure out where and when you want to be at that conference. I hope you put us down as one of the sessions that you can't miss. It's going to be a lot of fun. And I also will link up the episode we did a couple of summers back about getting diabetes gear to stick, you know, in the sweaty, hot summer. I think it's probably time to redo that episode because a lot of new patches have come out, some new techniques. So watch for my questions for you because that episode is all from listeners with their advice. And it's really good stuff. Again, I'll I'll link that up in the show notes and at diabetes-connections.com. And I'll be soliciting for your techniques in the weeks to come. I think we'll do that probably in July. In our community connection this week, let's talk about type 1 diabetes and the do-it-yourself folks, the we-are-not-waiting crowd, and what recently happened with the FDA. Community Connection is brought to you by Tandem, makers of the T-Slim X2 insulin pump. And you know, Benny is just finished with eighth grade, and this is the age where the hangouts begin around here. You know, they, they go to the mall or downtown. He's at a, he's hanging out with friends right now. He's just hanging out at the shopping village, not far from the house and walking around. Benny loves just having his T-Slim X2 insulin pump in his pocket. He's got the Dexcom sensor on. He can see BG on his pump. He's well experienced with what he needs to do. He knows to monitor his symptoms, confirm the pump settings are correct and pay attention to potential alerts. And he always has his diabetes bag with all his backup supplies, but he's 14. He doesn't want to constantly be checking things, pulling out a pump controller or a meter. I'm really glad we have this technology to help us during this transition time from tween to teen. And to find out more about Benny's pump, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Tandem logo. A couple of weeks ago, there was a big news burst about an FDA warning against the use of do-it-yourself automated insulin dosing systems. Uh, I'm not going to rehash the entire thing here. If you listen to this podcast, there's a really good chance that you're in the Facebook groups where this was discussed or you've read the news stories about them. But the reason I, I decided to include this is not so much because of what the FDA said, but because of the response from the DIY community and a little bit of personal information that I wanted to share. So very briefly, 
The FDA got a notice that a person with diabetes was sent to the hospital after an accidental overdose of insulin with a self-constructed, quote, artificial pancreas system. According to some sources, and I will link all of this up so you can go through it yourself and see, a person was using a Libre sensor on a DIY CGM app. Basically, they were using a non-FDA approved device to turn the Libre into something that would continuously show the values. You know, the Libre is always reading, but it's not always displaying. So, you know, there is no clinically tested or FDA approved app to do this with the Libre. The FDA received the report of the adverse event because it caused the person's system to overdeliver insulin and the person needed to be hospitalized for the hypoglycemia that followed. My understanding is that the person is okay. And my take on this is that the FDA has to report this, right? When it gets an adverse report of things like this, they write it up, they report it. They do the same thing when FDA approved devices malfunction. So, you know, I don't understand people who are getting upset that the FDA said something. That doesn't make any sense to me. There was a lot of mistake in reporting on this, but that's generally because reporters uh, and media, they don't understand diabetes to begin with. So to expect them to understand the differences between CGMs and off-label use, you know, it's a big challenge. But Katie D. Simone, who we've had on the show and is now working with Tidepool, she's really been a huge advocate for Loop, um, a, a leader in the do-it-yourself online community. She's helped a ton of people. She wrote a terrific post on this. She has a great blog. Many of you have already been there probably seeing how to extend your sensors. You may not even realize you've read her blog before, but I will link that up as well. And she talks about the real risk here comes because of the limited access to really good health tools. I mean, the FDA has been slow to approve things that we wish they were quicker on, and people around the world have complained that their government systems have done the same. So her take is that we wouldn't need to DIY all this stuff if things moved faster. And a lot of people also said that, you know, they weigh the risks and they've decided that using these things off-label is actually safer. So I can't speak to that at all. But as I was reading these articles and, and kind of taking all this stuff in, it occurred to me that all of type 1 diabetes is pretty much do-it-yourself, right? I mean, we see our healthcare providers for 15 minutes a couple of times a year. If you're lucky, a lot of adults may see an endocrinologist once a year or see their general practitioner because they don't have an endo in their area. And then you're on your own. And we turn to the community for help. And I realized further that the way we manage Benny's diabetes is completely DIY. I mean, we have a prescription and use completely on-label, if that's a term, uh, but FDA-approved insulin pump, FDA-approved continuous glucose monitor, and we use an FDA-approved long-acting insulin. But there is no clinically tested FDA-approved, you know, here's the study on using these things all together as we've done. This untethered, there's a lot written on it. There's a lot of personal experience. Our endocrinologist and I, we didn't sit down and open up the FDA brochure on how to do this. We discussed it and we educated each other. We we agreed to try it and it's worked really well. But what worked for Benny using Traceba for half of his basal, using the pump for the other half of the basal, and using a CGM to monitor it all. And we also have the software that talks to the CGM. That may not work for somebody else. So when I say all of type 1 is DIY, that's what I mean. It's really interesting to me to look at it that way. So again, I'll link all of this up. If this was new to you, please go ahead and read the news items, read the blog post, and and you really get educated on this. If you had heard about it, thank you very much for listening to my take. I appreciate it. And now it's time for Tell Me Something Good. And that is brought to you by Real Good Foods. And in Tell Me Something Good this week, we're going to be talking about some pretty cool athletic achievements. But you know, we like to try new foods around here. My kids, thankfully, as I mentioned in the talk with Maura, uh, they're really good at that. My daughter went through a phase where she was not so good at that, but they're both fine now. And Benny is always up for a taste test. So when we saw Real Good Foods has all of this great stuff to try, We were really excited and we did like a taste test. We just bought a bunch of stuff at our local Harris Teeter and we did pizza, the Supreme and the plain. We did the the poppers. We did the enchiladas. 
And I asked Benny because he started with the Supreme Pizza, which is like a personal size pan pizza with a lot of yummy toppings. So I told him, save me a bite. You know, whether you like it or not, save me some. And of course, he ate the whole thing. So since then, we've tried a lot more of their products. They have these new breakfast sandwiches that are so good. And you can find more about them online. The cauliflower crust pizzas. Oh, my God. I almost forgot to mention. They are so yummy. And it's so easy when you want something that's convenient and low carb good stuff. Find out more at diabetes-connections.com and click on the Real Good Foods logo. Tell Me Something Good is all about your accomplishments, big or small. We're looking for, you know, diversaries, milestones. And this week we have a couple of athletes to tell you about. This first one came from my local Facebook group, and Nikki says she is so proud of her T1D son and his high school baseball team. Jackson is a senior at Morrisville Senior High School. They made it to the state championships for the first time ever, and they won. And she included this amazing picture from our local newspaper, and I'll put that in the Facebook group. It's a great picture. Team is all celebrating. And this team had an autograph signing session in Mooresville at the local Dick's Sporting Goods. I mean, this was big time, great stuff. So congratulations to Jackson. Nikki, thank you so much for sending that in. Also in North Carolina, Michael Stone has earned a place in the senior games. This is in cycling, and he is representing his county in the state games this fall. Now, not only does Michael live with type 1 diabetes, but a little bit over a year ago, he broke his hip and he needed full replacement surgery. He credits his exercise regimen, you know, for helping him get back into such great shape after hip surgery. The senior games apparently is something that's only in North Carolina. Maybe your state has something similar, but it began in 1983 to promote healthy living to people over the age of 50 across the state. They've got everything from arts to athletics, like cycling. And if they win in Raleigh in the fall, then they can move on to the national games. So good luck, Michael Stone. That is pretty cool. I mean, obviously, it's difficult with type one, but to break your hip and then jump on a bike and and be a champion within a year, that's great stuff. And a big congratulations for Taylor Adams, who summited Mount Everest in May. He's 30 years old. He's a pediatric ICU nurse, and he was diagnosed with type one diabetes as a kid. I saw a lot of posts about this online, some with not the best information. And, uh, you know, I'm not trying to slam anybody. It's an incredible achievement. But I saw things like first person with type one up Mount Everest, and it didn't come from Taylor, certainly. But let's just clear that up real quick. Taylor is actually the fourth person with type 1 diabetes to summit Everest. The first, I'm going to say his name wrong. I apologize. The first is Josu Feju. He is from Spain. He summited May of 2006. Just a few days later, Will Cross, the first American with type 1 diabetes, summited May 26th. And then Sebastian Sassville, who is Canadian, he summited two years later. And we've had Sebastian on the show, and he's just an amazing guy. He's also run across the Sahara. I mean, most of these guys have done pretty outrageous things. Sebastian was the first person to wear an insulin pump on Mount Everest, and I'm pretty sure that Taylor wore his as well. I will link up all the information on all of them. There's some great articles that include the first three, and then, of course, Taylor just recently did this incredible accomplishment. I mean, it's amazing to think that there was a time when people said, you know, oh, people with type 1 diabetes shouldn't do anything strenuous. Now we've got four of them who've gone up Mount Everest. Unbelievable stuff. So tell me something good. Don't be intimidated. You do not have to win your high school state championship or go up Everest to be featured. Shoot me an email, stacy at diabetes-connections.com or post in the Facebook group when you see the tell me something good photo. I would really love to hear from you. The plan for next week's show is to grab some of the research and studies that are coming out of the American Diabetes Association scientific sessions and bring those to you. I'm taping this episode before that conference even starts. So a bit of a roll the dice here a little bit to see what we get. Should be interesting stuff. But if we are able to grab an interview or two, that will be in next week's show bringing you some information from the ADA. Thank you, as always, to my editor, John Buchanan, from Audio Editing Solutions. Thank you, as always, for listening. And make sure you sign up for the newsletter this month before June 15th. It's going to be good. I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you back here next week. Diabetes. 
Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged. <laughs>